TSN's Motoring 94 is brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, trust your car to Midas. One man's junkyard is another man's castle, or something like that. Hello everybody, and this week Motoring 94 is at the junkyard, also known as the auto wrecking yard, and most recently they call this the recycling yard. Either way, these junkyards have been around since the birth of the automobile. And while this is the final resting ground for the vehicles, bargain hunters will tell you that for years this has been a gold mine for used parts. And believe me, the business is booming. We'll tell you more about that later on. But first, I guess flea markets have become very popular as a shopping haven for bargain hunters. Well, recently, Motoring 94 dropped in on a flea market. A flea market for cars. This is our fourth annual auto jumble. It's like a flea market for British car parts. We've got a lot of vendors here, people selling cars, and all the other British car clubs from the general Toronto area. Well, I'd say the majority of people here are North American, Canadian. There's a few British people, but North Americans fell in love with British sports cars, and they still do. I'm restoring a, a 1968 MGB and uh, I am getting very close to completion and there are certain parts that I do need and there's certain parts that I could probably use better parts so I came out here to see you know what I could find and ended up picking up a gas tank for my uh, 68. I know mine isn't working and I know I need one so I mean it is a risk it, being 300 brand new and 30 the, the, the purchase price I think I did okay it's just a bit of a risk you gotta take that's the way it goes. Okay, this, this is just part of the stuff that we got today here. Um, here's some uh, rubber for the side of uh, an MGB windshield. And uh, then there's some used stuff here, which is for TR3, which is in very, very good condition, actually, and it's a uh, very good price. Um, we've got a European um, TR6 uh, side marker here, which is also quite rare. It's, it's very handy if you've got it. Are these things you were looking for when you came here? I mean, are these... Yeah, specifically looking for. Yeah, yeah, the things that we're looking for, exactly, and uh, hope and hope to find. And uh, I have over there an, a Jag XKE uh, exhaust system, which I didn't expect to find, but I'm happy to find. An entire. Exhaust yeah, system? yeah, which is a real bargain. The, these are the front cap rails for the balance of the TR3B. Um, they're they're actually they normally corrode, and they're, they're quite difficult to find in this part of the country. You end up usually going out to Carlisle, Pennsylvania to pick this sort of stuff up. But, you uh, come to a lot of these places, you, you pick through garbage and Yes, things, just, I'm a British car it. addict, that's it. <laughs> it's an addiction, but they're, they're fun to drive and they're, they're nice to use and uh, this is one of the most economical ways of keeping them on the road. I, I guess that uh, when you look at all the businesses here, we have companies here that do between 500000 to a million dollars in sales a year. They employ anywhere between 10 to 25 people. They count on uh, people who are involved in the restoration business, it's a, a very qualified type of audience and um, it, it's, uh, it, it's something that really hasn't been recognized. So being here, is, it's great to see this type of exposure for them. This is 1950 Rover, model 75 Cyclops. It's called Cyclops because of that round thing on the front that should be a lamp. but. For export, they stuck in that chrome thing that says 75 on it. This was my grandmother's car out in Winnipeg, and uh, um, she died in 1974 at the age of 97, but drove the car up to about 1970, and then got too short to see over the horn ring. So when she died, my dad took the car over and stuck it in his garage covered it with a dirty piece of tarp and I said uh, it'd be fun to have that car but then I got married moved out east and finally my dad said get the thing out of my 
garage. All it needed was a rotor, condenser, some new plugs, and a tank of gas. I think when it was first bought, it would be $3,500 to $4,000. A fellow over there has just told me it's like having $20,000 in the bank. This was news to me. <laughs> but, uh, so I think I'll hang on to it for a while. It's a 60, 1965 MGB GT, and uh, it was, it's extremely early for the model, the GT. Um, my dad got it from some guy so that we could fix it up and sell it so we can get some money for my car, because I have a 66 B Roadster. And uh, it's in pretty good condition. It would make a really good project car. Um, I'm 13 years old. Um, my dad, ever since I was born, he's been into um, the automotive business. He restores Austin Healy's. And I've always been, I've always loved, loved helping him out in the garage and that. And I've, I, since I was about 10, I've been saving up and saving up my money from my allowances and all that so I could one day get a car. And so I've saved up and I've gotten myself one and I'm going to restore it myself and hopefully I can sell this so I can get some money so I can do my car. How's business? Good. Yeah. Good. Better than a lot two years ago. It, we've had good business for all the year because we're the only place in Canada that you can walk in and walk out with 39 to 55 car parts. In, Where do you get all your parts from? England mostly, not, because the pound is two dollars, American dollars a dollar thirty-five, so we had to quit buying from the United States. No, we got the best prices because we're not greedy for money. <laughs> I'm 83 years old, been restoring T cars for 17 years. And now we stock the parts only because I'm too old to call on their cars to restore them. Everybody should have one of these. You get what you need. <laughs> Good luck. Okay, take care, guys. Their driving careers may be over. But many of today's junked autos may extend the lives of other vehicles by donating their used parts. Stark Auto Parts in Toronto has been in business for 15 years with customers throughout North America. Three years ago, the business expanded to include luxury European parts. That was a hobby of mine ever since I was growing up and I always wanted to get into the luxury end of the cars like BMWs, Mercedes, Jacks, Porsche. And seeing that I was in this business, it was a natural to expand into that line. Uh, no one else really is specializing on used parts for these vehicles. And uh, we decided to go out and attempt to uh, buy up all kind of wrecks in these type of vehicles and uh, publicize, and uh, it worked out quite well, actually. Well, a lot has to do with the recession. People are realizing that uh, it's a lot of money to spend on certain parts. Uh, certain parts can run $3,000, $4,000, $5,000. If uh, they need an engine, for example, that could run up to, if they buy it new, $12,000, $13,000, where they can get a good used one for anywhere from two to three. All sorts of people come in here. Uh, you have body shop owners coming in here, mechanical shop owners coming in here, and as well as a lot of owners of these vehicles themselves. They uh, bring their own tools at times, but we like to look after them ourselves when it comes to these cars. We'll have our own people dismantle most of the parts for them on these type of cars. But if it's something small, you know, we'll allow them to do it, provided they don't cause any damage. We run every so often. Uh, we try to do it a couple times or three times a, a year from March till October area. We call it a Saturday special. And what that is, uh, we charge admission of $40 per person to get into the yard. Uh, with that $40, once they're in the yard, anything that they can physically carry out off the ground individually, not teaming up, is theirs for that $40. So they can take four tires or they can take, we've seen a guy take an engine out over his back. By himself. By himself, yes, it was quite <laughs> funny watching him go out and the minute he got out to the road, he dropped. <laughs> and as well, one guy also carried a whole front end for a Buick. It's. Uh, Quite funny, but uh, it's a real deal because, for example, that front end on the Buick, if he would have come in during the week, would have cost him anywhere from $800 to $1,000, and he got it for $40. Driving a Jaguar is but a dream for most of us. But Budget Rent-A-Car would like to make that dream come true. 
the world's third largest car and truck rental system has added 500 XJ6 sedans to their American fleet. The program, with an estimated showroom value of more than $25 million, is the largest ever order for Jaguar cars. Our Midas tip of the week concerns brake adjustments. Now many of today's cars have disc brakes all around and in most cases they don't require adjustment. But there's still an awful lot of cars with drum brakes on the rear like this 91 Cavalier that require periodic manual adjustment. Now by design this system is supposed to be self-adjusting. Every time you back the car up and cram the brakes on it's supposed to ratchet itself up and adjust. But in actual practice in many cases a lot of drivers don't back up briskly enough to adjust it or sometimes the mechanism gets a little bit hung up and just doesn't work properly. In any case, we quite often find that when we pull the brake drum off, there's a lot of clunking. You can see the slack between the drum dimension and the shoe dimension. Now what we do in that case is just take the ratcheting adjustment and run that adjustment up till we get the, the uh, brake drum pretty close to the brake shoe diameter. This is an adjustment that we suggest you do at least once a year or every time the tires are rotated. That's your Midas tip of the week. Test Drive with Graham Fletcher. This week on Test Drive, we look at the 1994 Toyota Celica. Now, I normally don't comment upon style because after all, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. But on this Celica, there are a couple of styling cues that really caught my eye. The first one starts back here, runs up over the roof line, down the hood, and molds nicely into the outer headlight binnacle. The other thing that really serves to finish off the front end very nicely are the two raised humps over the inner headlights. Under the hood of the new Celica is a 2.2-litre 16-valve 4 that produces 135 horses and 145 pounds-feet of torque. While these figures are not that great, the performance is certainly more than adequate. Matched with this willing engine is a four-speed automatic that features electronic control. During the upshifts, the ignition timing is temporarily retarded to improve shift quality. When equipped with this powertrain, the Celica requires about eight seconds to reach the 100K mark. For those looking for better performance, I would suggest you go with the manual tranny. It shaves about a full second off this time. The rest of the performance numbers are good, with mid-range performance being better than expected. For the record, we averaged a very respectable 9.1 litres per 100 kilometres, or 31 miles per gallon. The trunk on this Celica has got one major drawback. Slap bang in the middle of the trunk floor is a great big hump. Now that hump houses the full-size spare tyre. Now I'd take the hump along with the full-size spare tyre any day versus one of those Mickey Mouse donut tyres and a nice flat floor. Stopping power for the Celica is provided by a four-wheel disc brake setup that included the optional anti-lock system. These brakes are powerful by any standards, part of the reason being the tandem booster. This gives you the benefits of a larger booster in a compact form. During the brake test, we required just 109 feet to stop from 80K. Short is not the word. The suspension is comprised of McPherson struts at all four corners, which is pretty standard stuff. However, some fancy engineering gets the best out of the system. The upgraded sports suspension gets special two-stage shocks. These things ensure a very controlled ride throughout the range of suspension travel. Add to these sway bars at both ends, anti-dive geometry and a rear suspension that imparts some towing under hard cornering and you have a setup that provides superior ride and handling as well as excellent accident avoidance characteristics. Now the latter is probably just as well or I might have pulled a Dave Winfield on an unsuspecting seagull. One of the neat pieces of technology on this Celica is a new sheet metal. That's ordinary sheet steel. This is the new vibration damping steel. Now what you have here is like a laminated windshield. There's basically two sheets of steel with a resin center and it's that resin that absorbs a lot of the noise. On a conventional type steel what you have is an awful lot of padding to stop engine noise from filtering back through the firewall and bugging the passengers. 
Using this stuff, you actually realize about a 20% weight saving when compared to the traditional way of soundproofing the firewall. What's the big deal? The big deal is that weight saving will help when it comes to fuel economy. Now on this Celica, you can actually hear the difference. That's normal steel. That's the new steel. As well as using the vibration damping steel in the firewall, Toyota have also incorporated it into the rear shock towers. So effective is this stuff that the usual boombox effect found in hatchbacks was virtually non-existent. It also served to quieten the howl from the snow tires on our tester. My pet peeve on this Celica has to do with the driver's side sun visor. Right slap bang in the middle is a mirror that doesn't come with a cover. All you end up seeing is a glorious view of your own lap. Now when you're trying to drive, that type of information is not wanted, not necessary, and very distracting. Inside, the GTS comes very well appointed. The dash features a full set of analog gauges that present the right info in a logical fashion, and both driver and passenger are treated to airbags. The radio cassette player comes with its own graphic equalizer and no fewer than six speakers. This ensures wonderful surround sound quality. Toyota get a gold star for mounting this unit above the climate controls. The climate controls themselves are logical and large enough to operate with gloves on. The front seats come with huge base and back bolsters. The latter extend up to provide some shoulder support. In short, these things do a great job of keeping the occupant put when you start to use the Celica to its potential. In the back, you'll find some very cramped seats, the saving grace being that they will suffice in an emergency. The seat backs themselves are split and fold and can be locked in the upright position. Well, that's it for this week's test drive. I think it's safe to say that Toyota have improved the new Celica in every area. Ride, handling, performance, and even styling are all better. The only question left in my mind is can they truly justify the $28,000 price tag? Next week on Test Drive, we'll take a look at our long-term access as well as updating our long-term Jetta. This Lincoln Town Car came into Stark's Auto Body and it was a vehicle that was not involved in a collision. You see, this car was a victim of a theft. After the 30-day waiting period, the insurance company paid out on the vehicle. In the meantime, the punks that had stolen this car took the gas tank off, changed it into a propane-powered vehicle, changed the serial number and put a license number on the side to make it look like an airport limo. Well, the police finally caught on to the scam. The vehicle ended up here and now has a new owner. You know, there's as many stories back here in the junkyard as there are cars. All right, it's now time to head to the garage and join another man who likes to collect used parts, and that, of course, is Bill Gardner. Well, Brad, you know it's a love-hate relationship with these old uh, scrap cars. Uh, you hate to have them sitting around the shop because they make it look like a heck of a mess. But boy, do you ever love to have them when you're looking for that insignificant little part that might take you 20 minutes on the phone to find. And you still don't know if, you're gonna, if the right one's going to arrive after you wait a couple of days for the dealer to get it in. So I found that in a lot of cases, it's much better for me to just stop by an auto records. I can visually identify what I'm looking for. And in a lot of cases, just go and get it. And uh, of course, there's a huge price savings, usually about 50%. And that's one thing you should keep in mind when you're shopping at Auto Wreckers. You should know the price of the new one because in many cases a lot of uh, new items have come down significantly in price and if, if you're not aware of the new price or the guy at the wrecker isn't, you know, you, you may pay a little bit too much. A, a good rule of thumb is about 50% of the price of a new one. But uh, I really like getting driveline parts from the wreckers, things like complete engines, transmissions and rear ends because I've had much better luck with uh, grungy looking engines that came out of cars with significant mileage on them. I've had much better luck with those than I've ever had with a rebuilt engine that looked nice and pretty but was actually full of a bunch of parts that were ground within an inch of their life and maybe half of that engine was reassembled with aftermarket parts of shoddy uh, quality. Whereas the engine that you get from the wreckers, in many cases it's the original engine, never been touched and it's got all OE parts. They're Ford parts, they're GM, whatever. and. Uh, I'll trust that uh, greasy looking engine any day. 
Now a couple other things that you should keep in mind when you're putting things like engines and transmissions in is to replace any critical seals or gaskets while you've got it out because it may only be a half hour job to change that seal on the bench. If you stick it in the car and find out that it's leaking, it's three and a half hours to change. Now another thing you want to be sure of when you're dealing with these places is make sure that you're dealing with a guy that gets mostly collision cars, not the rust bucket, derelict junkers that are collected, you know, left in, in plazas and, and parking lots with no plates on them. Because those collision cars were cars that were looked after right up until the time that something happened and took them out of commission. They had oil changes, they had tune-ups, they had maintenance. Those rust buckets, they were probably limping around town with uh, oil that had been in there for years and you know, in many cases those engines aren't great. Another thing, one of the uh, mo items that I find handiest to get from them is things like uh, wiring harness bits, like you see right here. Now that's the heater resistor pack off this 86 Grand Marquis. And if you went to the uh, wreckers and you needed this plug, quite often this plug is uh, damaged on the car. It either corrodes or melts. And you may find that it's not available from the dealer in many, many cases. All you do at the wreckers is snip off that plug three or four inches back. When you get back to the shop, you can uh, make a nice soldered connection, heat shrink it and tape it. It's just as good as new. And in case you're squeamish about uh, buying used parts or uh, something that somebody else has used or it's something that's dirty, don't worry about it. That's what's taking you down the road in your car right now. And as soon as you get over that hurdle, believe me, you'll be down there just like me, saving all kinds of money and saving yourself lots of headaches and waste time on the phone. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 94. Kenzie's Corner with Jim Kenzie. This is the sort of place that you'd expect to find parts for your 1974 Cutlass Supreme, but this ain't your father's Oldsmobile. Then again, this ain't your father's junkyard either. Uh, excuse me, recycling center. Now, as you heard earlier, this particular facility has a division that caters to luxury car parts. This, of course, is a Jaguar XJ6, and in a garage just down the street, there are several BMWs and Mercedes Benzes. And they're not old babies like this one either. Some of them are two and three year old cars that cost $50,000 and more. Well, what's going on here? Can't rich people afford to fix their own cars anymore? Well, listen, they didn't get to be rich by throwing their money away. Just today, I heard Mary Lou talking to a customer who was looking for an engine wiring harness for a 1992 BMW. He crashed the car and he's rebuilding it rather than trying to buy a new one. A brand new harness is gonna cost him $1,400. Mary Lou figures if she can find one for him, it'll be less than half that. Wouldn't you go for a deal like that? I know I sure would. I needed some parts for my 1991 BMW, and I got them just down the street a couple of weeks ago. I'm Jim Kenzie. Hey, Mary Lou, are those uh, floor mats ready yet? Now, I'm an optimist, but come on. You can't tell me there's one useful part left on this piece of junk. I say that now, but I'll bet you in a few minutes, somebody will come walking by here with a toolbox and prove me wrong. Well, that's it for now. Next week, we're going to be in the Maritime. Make sure you join us as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 94 has been brought to you by Quaker State. Quaker State, one tough motor oil. And Midas, for brake, exhaust, suspension, and steering service, Trust your car to Midas. Well, this, this car is actually a truck. It's a British Leyland Mini pickup truck. It's model year 1983. And in Canada, we had a problem with these because we didn't get any cars or trucks after 1980. That was the last year they were sold in Canada. They're still produced in England, but the trucks themselves, the commercial vehicles, stopped production in 1983. So it's kind of a unique vehicle here. What I did to get this was, I worked at the dealer, and believe it or not, I bought parts brand new and assembled a new vehicle from parts. It was extremely expensive, but very rewarding. This has a lot of room in it. There's not as much room in the cab, but my wife and I love it. We can put all our camping gear in there, and it's just a hoot. She loves people waving and smiling and carrying on when they go past us. But I'm, I'm used to it now.